Uh, this morning we're going to talk about some work we started doing uh, to do better with soot deposition and uh, talk about the impact of uh, gravitational settling, uh, soot particle size, and agglomeration. I'd like to thank my co-authors, uh, Chris Overholt, who's in the back of the room, and DK from the University of Texas at Austin. Did I get that right? All right. Right arrow? No, no. Okay, there we go. Wasn't focused. Um, so for those of you who had a chance to read that eye chart of all those validation metrics yesterday, um, you would have seen that in general for most quantities we're, you know, 5 to 10 percent. There's a couple were on the order of, you know, 15 to 20 percent. There was one that really stood out, and that, that was, you know, soot density, where we're like on the order of like 60 percent error. And um, what you can see here is the uh, NIST NRC benchmark series three tests that were done as part of the International Collaborative Fire Model Project, one of these experiments that Kevin talked about yesterday, um, where we just had a you know, very large compartment with a spray burner on the inside. We used different fuels. Um, the, the idea was it was representing just a typical room in the nuclear power plants. There was cable trays and, and things of that nature in it. Uh, but when you look at the results, um, what you see on the top left is uh, CO2 in the, in the space where uh, open circles are where the door was open, the compartment uh, filled circles where the door is closed. And you see that, you know, it's kind of what you'd expect, right? I mean, you, you get the right amount of heat release rate, you specify the fuel correctly, you should get the right amount of CO2 produced. These are all well ventilated tests, you know, pretty much all the models look like this, right? You get the right CO2 amount. But when you look at the, the soot density, we're greatly over predicting the closed door tests and somewhat over predicting the open door tests. And this, this is the same for MAGIC, for CFAST, you know, whatever, whatever tool you're, you're looking at. Um, so you might think, okay, well, you know, what, what could be the cause for this? You know, what, what are we not accounting for? Um, you know, the burners were characterized out in the open underneath the hood where they measured, you know, using optical density, what they, the soot yield was for the fuels. Okay, well, maybe putting the burn in the room might have had an impact, but you'd expect that if, if it was going to be an impact, it's not going to be the burners going to become more efficient, right? It's going to be the burners going to be less efficient in a room where you have reduced entrainment. So that would act to increase the soot yield. So that, that doesn't help us. Um, well, maybe, you know, compartment, we're in a compartment rather than the open, so we might have hot temperatures, we might be oxidizing the soot. Um, but the upper layer temperatures are well below 500 C, so this, there's no soot oxidation occurring. Um, you know, one, one possibility as well, you know, we're deriving the soot density from extinction measurements, assuming, you know, it's 8,700 meters squared per kilogram. Um, so maybe, you know, there's some impact on the compartment that's affecting this. Um, you know, we would have to have radically different values in that effective constant, you know, between the closed and open door test. That just doesn't seem like it would explain this, this disparity. Um, the only thing that we can think of that would really, you know, account for this would be deposition of soot on the surface. And that's something that would definitely impact the closed door test more than an open door test, right? An open door test, the fire plume goes up to the ceiling, it flows out the door, the soot doesn't have a lot of residence time, not a lot of time to deposit. In the closed door test, it just sits there for the entire test, plenty of time for, for deposition to occur. So it definitely seemed to be a mechanism that would, you know, explain, you know, this, this disparity in our predictions. Um, so what we did is we added uh, some simple deposition routines to, uh, to FDS. Um, these were all based on work done back in the 60s by the nuclear industry. Uh, a couple of codes, uh, Victoria and Charm, that were looking at, you know, radionuclide aerosols from power plant accidents. They did a lot of work sort of developing these engineering models. You know, back then, you know, you know, it was really a lot of hand calculations, you know, your large old mainframes, not a lot of horsepower to throw at problems. Um, so we have our three uh, deposition mechanisms. On the top is uh, gravitational, and this is just what you'd expect, right? This particle has a mass, it's heavier than the air, it will, will fall until it reaches some terminal velocity based on its cross-sectional area. So larger particles will fall faster, have a higher terminal velocity. There's a thermophoretic, uh, which is the, the middle term there. And this is um, basically, you know, the, you know the, the impact of heat on the particle. And particles will move along temperature gradients from high temperature to low temperature. So you have a hot gas on the cold surface. There'll be a force that will drive the particle to deposit on the wall. And then the final term is turbulent deposition. And this is essentially that you have a you have a turbulent boundary layer. So if a soot particle is sitting at the top of the boundary layer, you know there's some random motion might bring into contact with the wall and, and have it stick. And that's a function of uh, the boundary layer thickness, this 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 tau plus, and the and the um, friction velocity on the wall, this, this u tau term. And depending on you know the magnitude of that, you have different uh, you know, turbulent deposition magnitudes that might occur. 
And the figure on the upper right you know, just uh, depicts these, right? So if we're on the ceiling, we have thermothoretic and turbulent deposition. In the gas phase, we have, we have gravitational settling. That's the soot will settle in the gas. And then if you have a horizontal surface facing upwards, you can get turbulent deposition, thermothoretic, or gravitational deposition on the surface. Um, so we added this uh, to FDS, and then you know, we've done a little validation. This is some work done uh, by, by Chris Overholt. Uh, you know, so the simple test, it's just a duct where they generated uh, monodisperse <laughs> particles, flowed them through the duct, and then measured the deposition on you know, panels they could re remove and, and, and look at the deposition. So here we see uh, for f uh, floor, ceiling, and walls, uh, ceiling being red for the green and walls the black. Um, they're predicted on the uh, vertical axis and the measured deposition on the, on the horizontal axis. And, you know, it's a you know, relatively good agreement be between the two for the deposition. This would account for the turbulent and the gravitational mechanisms. Um, these are isothermal flows, so there's no thermophoretic in it. Um, so, you know, we seem to have coded, you know, the equations, you know, correctly based on the simple tests. You know, so there's some similar simple verification work for the thermophoretic. Um, when we look at the equations for the, for the deposition, right, they, they all have some kind of a, uh, um, a particle size in them. You know, in the gravitational, there's a radius because you have this cross-sectional area for the drag. In the thermophoretic, um, this, this K thermophoretic term in the front has a, has a radius built into it. And then in the, in the turbulent uh, particle size as well, there's a, you know, there's, there's a radius term in the tau plus uh, for the particles. So all, so all these are, are particle size dependent. Um, so we took the entire you know, set of tests done for the benchmark series three. We ran them with one micron and 10 micron particles, um, looking at you know, well, what's the impact on this. With one micron particles, you know, the results looked pretty much like before. You know, there's a little shift downwards towards the, you know, the, the equal prediction line. Uh, with 10 micron particles, you can see that now we're suddenly getting you know, fairly good predictions. The open door tests are pretty much dead on, and now we're only over predicting by you know, 20 percent or so for the closed door test versus you know, the factors of two and three that we were seeing before. Um, so one question is, okay, well, you know, can, can we justify you know, this larger particle size uh, for these fires? These were uh, heptane spray fires and uh, toluene spray fires um, in the compartment. Um, if you go into the literature, you can see that for, for highly sooted fuels, things like toluene and acetylene, you know, post-flame particle diameters, they're, they're pretty large particles, you know, 10 microns, 100 microns. Um, but for pretty much everything else, um, post-flame, you know, immediately post-flame particle sizes, you know, generally have about, you know, two-thirds, three-quarters of the mass sitting in particles below one micron in size. Um, so it you know, seemed hard to justify, you know, just right off the bat using this 10 micron particle size. Uh, you know, for the for the heptane fuel, maybe for the, the toluene fuel, you know, because that would make sense with, with what's in the literature. Um, and the, the chart you hear is just some work done by SP in Sweden where they actually measured, you know, very small scale uh, kind of samples, uh, mass size uh, distributions uh, for different types of fuels. And as you can see, you know, in general, pretty much, you know, here's the one micron particle size and, you know, the, the vast majority of the mass sits on the other side of that, of that line. There is, however, a mechanism that could help us get there, you know, that help us form these, these larger <coughs> particles, and that is agglomeration. And this is a process where, you know, if aerosol particles come into contact with one another, they stick, and over time, the, the particle sizes grow. Um, you hear about this concept of soot aging in, in a fire, and that, that's what this is, is a process of agglomeration. The soot particle sizes get larger. Um, the process of agglomeration is driven by what's called the agglomeration kernel. Uh, so what you have is we have a number density of particles of some size m, and the, the, the rate of growth of those particles is by having particles whose sizes sum to m collide, and they make a particle m, or a particle with, of size m collides with another particle, becomes a bigger particle, and gets removed. And then you also have just removal in source terms, you know, the fire or ventilation flows or, you know, something that physically removes the soot from, from your domain. And what we can do with this equation is, because obviously this, this is, in essence, a continuum, right? You just have atoms of carbon that you're tacking on to a soot particle size to give the mass. So this is, this is essentially a continuum. 
Um, we, can, we can bin this into different bins of particle sizes. And since we want to cover a very large range, right, we're talking about microns, you know, tenth micron particles to ten plus micron particles. Um, and we can look at logarithmic bins where we have some constant ratio of the mass and bin sizes. And when we do that, you know, the integral terms get replaced by summation terms over the bins. And there's a weighting factor that applies to each of these collision uh, kernels, which allows a particle when it collides to split between bins. So if we have a bin that's, you know, a, a 10 kilogram bin, and we're colliding two six kilogram particles, we'll put some of the mass in the 10 kilogram bin and keep some of the mass in the less bin because we aren't exactly making, you know, the next bin size when we collide. Uh, the kernel we use, as I mentioned before, uh, came out of Victoria. It's a uh, radionuclide uh, aerosol deposition code, uh, best estimate code for Nuclear Regulatory Commission. And it divides this agglomeration kernel into four subsets. There's a, a Brownian motion, gravitational motion, and a shear and inertial. And I'll discuss what these are in the, the next slides. Um, so Brownian motion, this is just the, you know, the random motion of the particle as it collides with gas molecules in the air and does a random walk. And there's some possibility that that random walk will allow two particles to collide. Um, and the form of that equation is shown up here at the top. Uh, we, have a, we have a mobility factor. And the mobility factor is this, it's called with the Cunningham slip factor and the particle radius. It's just how, how easy is that for that particle to change direction, right? So less slower mass particle has more mobility. Um, and then there's a Fuchs factor, which deals with the, uh, the Brownian motion. You have your Brownian term in here. And so, so this kernel this gives for particle sizes of M and W, you know, the odds that they will collide and, and stick together, you know, at, 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 as a rate. Um, then there's gravitational um, agglomeration, and this is where, well, heavier particles fall faster than smaller particles. So a heavier particle could catch up with a smaller particle and result in agglomeration that way. Um, so what you have you know, this is then based on the, the terminal velocity of the two particle masses and then some you know, sticking factor and collision efficiency terms. You know, what's the probability that, that this will occur you know, given the relative uh, velocities between the particles? Um, the last two terms are shear and inertial. So uh, the, the inertial here is shown on the top, and that is that a, a heavier particle, it, it's harder for it to change its, its direction as, as it's moving along a streamline. So you have you know, a small particle and a heavier particle moving along streamlines. You know, if the streamlines bend, the smaller particle is going to follow the streamline easier than the larger particle, and you can get a collision that way. So that's, <laughs> that's inertial agglomeration. And then shear agglomeration is uh, it's, it's kind of similar. It's where you have streamlines that start to converge, and it can then bring you know, the particles together as streamlines converge uh, in the flow. And you know, that's the form of the, the term for the, for the shear. Um, so what we did, uh, we, did, we didn't actually uh, at this point add you know, this, this agglomeration scheme within FDS, wrote a, uh, a piece of code that sat outside of FDS that just uh, did a computation of the agglomeration as a function of time for these NIST on RC test series. Um, so what we used, and this was basically just taking this equation here and just writing this you know, short four-term program with, with all the terms, including the source terms. Uh, we took the, you know, the soot yield from the fire as measured by the reports. Uh, we assumed for heptane that the polyethylene numbers from the SP report were probably close enough. Uh, we didn't actually went able to locate you know, some good particle size data for heptane. We looked at 150 particle size bins, probably far more than you'd want to track in an actual CFD simulation. Um, we ignored removal of the soot on the walls. Um, we did account for removal based on doorway or HVAC flows. We just treated the compartment as one big lumped, lumped volume. So we had a source from the fire. We had a removal term based on the doorway flows measured. We just let agglomeration occur. Uh, if it was an open door test, we just looked at the upper layer volume as being the volume of the soot. If it was a closed door test, we, we used the whole volume of the compartment. Um, what we did after this is we then took these 150 bins and collapsed them into three bins of one, 3.6, and 10 microns. And as you see, these are multiples of log 10 of, of one another. And this was based on some work we had done modeling. Uh, FM Global had done a few years back that a one meter cubed uh, 
acrylic box where they had a smoke generator that sat outside. And they blew smoke in the box, and then they had filter paper and other measurement devices inside to measure you know, how the soot settled inside the box. And by looking at you know, modeling that test with different bins, we sort of came to the conclusion that you know, three bins you know, seemed a reasonable you know, approximation for, for you know, getting the handle on the, uh, the soot deposition in that test. So when we do this, um, here are two typical results for a closed door test and an open door test. Um, in the various tests, um, you know, different fire sizes, different test durations, but in general the, the behaviors between the two tests look similar based on whether they're closed or open. So in the closed door test, so this is the 10 micron, the 3.16 micron, and the 1 micron uh, mass fractions of the particle sizes. So this is the, the initial state. In the closed door test over time, uh, the particles agglomerate, so you, you, you lose the, the 1 micron particles and you make uh, the, th the three and the ten micron particles, and by the end of the test, you know the three micron particles are on the order of about half the mass that sits in the compartment. And this would be ten micron or, or larger uh, particles. Uh, with the open door test, um, what you see there's not a significant change in the particle size density or the, the particle size uh, distribution in the compartment, which which you might expect, right? There's not much time for agglomeration to occur before, because the door is open before the smoke just flows out of the door. There is a little agglomeration that occurs. You know, there is some residence time in the compartment. But, you know, these, so these two would sort of make sense with the, you know, results we saw, you know, early on, you know, that first slide where for the open door test, we were, you know, a little over prediction in the soot uh, uh, mass, mass present in the compartment, but not greatly so. And this would seem to indicate that you know if, if deposition is is an impact, and you know that's driven by particle size. That since you know the particle particle there's not much residence time, there's not really any change in size distribution. You know that probably helps explain why we're seeing those good results. But here in the closed door test, where by the end of the test, you know it's fairly large particles that are present in the compartment. You know this seems to follow you know that behavior that we saw. Um, so what we what we did then at that point is we just um, for you know, sort of first cut approximation of this is we just took these uh, time dependent durations and just made an average particle size distribution over the duration of the test. So it does sort of weight it towards these smaller particle sizes. And then we ran uh, the, the simulations using the one, the three, and the, and the ten bin. And again, this was, you know, just averaging that time dependent distribution over the entire test. And so here's the, the one micron, the ten micron, and then the, the three bin tests. And what we see if we go through this uh, standard error and bias estimate that Kevin had talked about yesterday is, you know, there is a reduction going to the three bins, which is still at this point kind of weighted more so than it should be to the smaller particle sizes, um, but not quite as much as we saw just going with the 10 micron particles. Um, but again, I think if, we, if this were an actual time dependent uh, particle size distribution, I think we would have seen more deposition in the latter part of the test that would have helped with that. But it does, I think, indicate that you know this, the deposition is, is is an important behavior, and we did see, you know, on the order of a 20% reduction in the arm bias. This was this really simple kind of cut at, at looking at the deposition. Um, so this is sort of the, continuing discussing the results. Uh, as I mentioned, the use of a single average distribution, we we bias towards the smaller particle sizes. Uh, so we're probably really not accounting for all of it. Some of the soot is going to be re-entrained into the flame. There's going to be some oxidation, not a lot, a little bit, and that will would help. Uh, we didn't account for you know, the simple agglomeration calculation that you know in that initial portion of the fire plume and the initial portion of the ceiling jet, you have much higher soot densities than on average in the rest of the compartment. So you'd see some rapid agglomeration occurring in the plume that we're really not capturing in this you know simple lump parameter model. Um, and there's one question. Uh, I haven't really found a good answer on you know, in the literature, and that is, you know, this this value that we all use measuring soot in compartment fires with with an optical density measurement is really based on you know relatively small particles. I mean, the work that Mulholland did, etc. I mean, these are all relatively small flames, and the and the idea behind this constant it's really based on the idea that the particle size is sort of similar to the wavelength size. When you start getting up to 10 micron particles, that's really no longer the case for the wavelengths being used for these optical density meters. And so I'm not really sure, you know, how well does the use of this constant work uh, for for larger particle sizes? Um, I haven't really found any good sets of test data where you know this is done along with a gravimetric measurement. 
you know, in the compartment where you'd have, uh, you know, lawn residence type of agglomeration to be able to determine this. Um, then, of course, you know, we really didn't have good data on exactly what the initial particle size distributions were for um, these fires. I think moving forward, you know, I think it's definitely worth looking at adding uh, an agglomeration mechanism to FDS, you know, to continue this this investigation into into soot deposition. Um, you know, it'd be useful, I think, to make efforts to measure physically measure deposition and agglomeration during fire tests. You know, as those opportunities present themselves. You know, just simple you know filter paper on surfaces that you can weigh before and after the test to measure soot deposition. Um, actually, agglomeration would have to be some kind of a you know impact or measurement during the fire test. Um, you know, to have actually better size distributions characterized for the fuels being used in the, in the fire test, as well as, um, you know, probably by making use of any gravimetric measurements made in conjunction with light extinction measurements, you know, assess, you know, does this use of the 8700 meters squared per kilogram, is that appropriate when you have larger particle sizes in the fire? And of course, I'd like to thank the uh, National Institute of Standards and Technology uh, that funded this work as part of the grant I've had uh, to assist in the development of FDS and you know the, the standard legalese that applies to, to a presentation funded by a grant. And at this time, I'll be happy to take any questions you might have. Could you quickly summarize the status of FDS 6 with respect to this? Yeah, so in FDS 6, I mean, all these uh, mechanisms are present in FDS 6. Um, it's not the uh, default uh, use. I mean, right now in FDS 6, if you just specify a you know, react line with the fuel or the CHO type inputs, uh, the soot gets uh, rolled into the uh, pump species for the products, and there's no deposition that occurs. You know, for, de for you to use deposition, you have to define your own reaction with soot as a separate species. That way it can be deposited uh, as an individual species, and you also have to define it as being an aerosol species, and that would then turn on uh, the deposition model. And at that point, you can define multiple soot species with different uh, mean particle diameters uh, to look at different particle diameters. And at this point in time, in our validation repository, um, the NIST NRC uh, series are currently using uh, the deposition. So if you look into those uh, inputs, you'll sort of see the basic approach for that. Plus, there's some examples in the uh, verification work as well as to how to turn on the, the deposition model. But it's not, it's at this point in time, it's not the default. We don't really have any good recommendations to make on, you know, well, how many bins do you need, how, what particle size should you specify for a fire. We don't have, you know, the agglomeration in there, so I don't think it's ready for, for prime time use quite yet. Any other questions? Could you just comment on why one would want to use this feature? I mean, um, what applications would yeah, this be so important? Yeah, for, so for typical, you know, kind of smoke control type application, I'm not sure this is something that you, you'd really want to use. I mean, sure, if you don't account for deposition, maybe you're predicting your smoke detection a little bit early. But, you know, in, in a fire that's going to threaten someone, that initial growth stage is usually relatively rapid through, um, you know, detection. If you're doing a T-squared fire, for example, you know, if your detector goes off at 30 seconds or 35 seconds, I mean, who cares? I mean, that's, you know, it doesn't matter. But, and, you know, for, if you're looking down that an egress situation, you know, we're talking about, you know, minutes, maybe tens of minutes if it's a really large, you know, complex building uh, for, for egress. I mean, yeah, deposition will buy you some additional time for egress. But at this point in time, since we don't really have Good recommendations to make. You know, it's more conservative to leave the soot, you know, there. You know, you know it becomes another conservatism. Where, where I think this will see the most benefit would be in the forensics type investigations. You know, where you have uh, photographic evidence uh, of a fire scene. You know, and we've uh, previously done some work that's published by the National Institute of Justice about how you can take a digital photograph of a white surface. And extract from that, you know, what the soot deposition, you know, quantitative soot deposition is on the walls. Uh, so in this case, you know, you could look at this could be another tool to help you do a, sort of a cause and origin type of investigation. You know, if your if your hypothesized fire can't reproduce the soot deposition that you've taken the photograph of, you you, you can rule it out. So. Any others? Okay. Well, thank you, Jason, very much. Thank you.